In a previous video, we discussed the weirdest monster retrains in Yu-Gi-Oh, and we determined that the topic was so dense that we could not fit it all into a single list, so we're doing another round of looking at the weirdest times that Yu-Gi-Oh monsters have been retrained. To summarize what a retrain is, it's when you take an existing monster, give it a new effect with some design changes, keep the same or similar balance of stats, and hope that it's useful in the modern game with its upgrade. And by weirdest, it could mean various things. The weirdness could be in the effect, choice of monster, or simply how they look. We always love a good artwork riff here. Also, joining me once again is my crew of co-hosts. Judgment Meter? Hi, hi, hi! Hi! Corgian from the Corgian Twitch channel. Hey! Sam from the Dungeon Dive Bar podcast. yo ho hoy Professor Oats. Meowdy. And professional eater of lemons, Syzygy Solo. Be on the lookout for the retrain of me eating a lime. Now, let's go again with the top 10 weirdest Yu-Gi-Oh! Monster Retrains Volume 2. Number 10, Maha Vilo Light of the Heavens. The original Maha Vilo was a card that stuck out from the early days. It had an effect where it gained 500 attack points for each equip card equipped to it, which was useful considering how common equip cards were early on, even if they were power crept pretty quickly. We also didn't get that many equip cards back in the day, so like... You got Horn of the Unicorn, you got Malevolent Nuzzler, you got Sword of Deep Seated, so I imagine like, I'm a guy, I've got a sword, I've got someone massaging me, I've got a horn on my head, I'm so cool. Maha Vilo also got a moment to shine in the anime, where it had a big introduction as one of Taya's ace cards before almost immediately being taken down a turn later. But hey, there's Maha Vilo! And thanks to having a notable enough anime appearance, Maha Vilo got a retrain nearly 20 years later, in 2020's Blazing Vortex, 20. 21 internationally. This retrain was almost a one-for-one -one copy of the original, looking at everything but the effect. Yet for some reason, they gave it double the level. They made it harder to get out that way. So we must have a pretty good payoff for that, right? Eh, we get a big old beat stick with some effect negation. That's about it. They have the same starting stat line, and depending on how many equip cards you have on this card, they gain additional effects. At least one gives you a thousand extra attack points for each equip card, two prevents monster effects from being activated during the battle phase only, three lets you send an equip card you control to the graveyard to negate an effect that targets Maha Vilo, four prevents all cards from activating during the battle phase, and five doubles all battle damage that this monster inflicts. So overall, meh. The targeting negation is nice, but many good effects activate outside the battle phase, so some of Maha Vilo's additional effects were not relevant or just underpowered. Plus, it's hard to get a lot of equip cards on them to begin with, with all the modern back row removal and negation. I can actually tell you this reason behind its name and why it got retrained. The reason it got retrained is Kazuki Takahashi really liked the artwork and wanted to reuse it. That's it. Two, the reason it's called Light of the Heaven is because its Japanese attack name is Holy Lightning. That's it. Even if the retrain wasn't useful in any decks, at least we got to see a design upgrade for Maha Vilo. They made everything on their clothes bigger. He looks cool. And he has the Konami balls. Yeah, he's got Konami orbs. You got it. Orbs. I'm changing. Nope, nope. We're changing it to Konami balls. <laughs> I am obsessed with Konami balls. Yeah, lots of balls. I like how the way it's retrained is just adding more bling. Powers up the only way it knows how. Mahavilo drape of the heavens. We put can we put the the supreme jacket on her. Dude. Number nine, Assault Mercenary. This is a retrain of Gene Warped Warwolf, who was a beat stick normal monster that never seemed like it had any prominence. It appeared in the anime a little, and I guess it was an ace card of Kalen slash Kiryu in a Yu-Gi-Oh 5D's flashback but it was released a bit too late where normal summon vanilla beat sticks were getting outclassed by stronger effect monsters. I'm not saying he wasn't useful since I still remember him being around, but I feel his impact in the real life card game and the anime wasn't enough where I would expect him to be chosen to be retrained. So, bit of history. For a while, the premier attackers in Yu-Gi-Oh were 1,800 four-star monsters. Well, you got, first you had your Skull Red Bird, then you had your Seven Colored Fish, then you had your Archfiend Soldier, don't forget Gemini Elf. And then Gene warped Warwolf, warped the meta with his staggering 2,000 attack. How is he so powerful? Because you are too busy trying not to mess up the words, Gene warped Warwolf, your guard is down. 
and then he gets you. This looks like a gene warped person, honestly. I don't really, like, outside of the ears, I don't really get any wolf vibes. So years later, when I saw the monster assault mercenary, I felt like I was seeing an actor in a movie that I vaguely recognized from a one-off appearance on Seinfeld years ago, and I'm pointing at the screen like, wait, I know this guy. This is normal Gene Warwolf. This is what he was supposed to look like before someone warped his jeans. They were probably in the wash or something. Yeah, look at those jeans. He's wearing his jeans now. Before he was wearing a kilt, now he's got pants on, he has got his cyber chainsaw gun, he is ready to go out for a night on the town. Assault Mercenary came out about two years after Gene warped Warwolf, and he supported the Assault Mode archetype, which was based around upgrading existing synchro monsters to their Assault Mode forms, where they had stronger effects and more protection. How good some of them were varied, but there was generally cool payoff to it. It just requires you to play a specific trap to special summon them, which you could search, and run the Assault Mode forms in your main deck, which could be special summoned from the deck itself, so you did not want to draw them. There was a lot of setup with a high potential of bricking, so play this deck at your own risk. Assault Mercenary, though, did nothing to help the deck, just having the effect to return the pivotal trap that you need to the deck to destroy a spell or trap on the field. Counterproductive, but I guess that's why he was never played in Assault Mode decks. Actually, being able to return the trap from the graveyard sounds like a pretty useful effect on paper, but still, I never really saw him used in these decks. So, why did they pick Gene Warped Warwolf for this job? We technically don't even know if this is supposed to be him, since they changed just enough aspects of his appearance where he could be someone different. He exchanged whatever his legwear was for some pants, is that a codpiece? Got a new hairstyle, including his shoulder hair, and lost two of his arms, or perhaps all of his arms, since the two that are left appear to be cybernetic. He kept his nails though, but the red pattern is now on his knuckles too so I'm guessing that's more than just nail polish. He had just been to the salon that very morning. He also got a shiny new weapon. I'm gonna be honest, I have no idea what that is, but I can assure you it's not a Talwar. I think the implication is that this is some sort of retrain of Gene Warped Warwolf because the stats add up to the same value on both cards, with 200 less attack and 200 more defense in the Mercenary. The type is now Warrior instead of Beast Warrior, but that's a pretty minor difference. In the end, and a lot of signs show us that this is indeed the Warwolf's new form, but with no other backstory elements, everything about him is a mystery. Number 8, Transonic Bird. Transonic Bird feels like the Lifetime Achievement Award for Sonic Bird, as a thanks for helping out all the ritual summoning decks over the years. He was introduced in the third TCG set when we also learned about ritual monsters, and Sonic Bird could just search any ritual spell needed to summon those ritual monsters. No strings attached as long as you normal or flip summon it. As the ritual meta evolved, the spells were always necessary, so the extra search with Sonic Bird was helpful, even when better search cards or archetype-specific search cards were created later on. And after you get your search with Sonic Bird, if you don't want him to be a sitting duck on the field, or a sitting eagle or whatever kind of bird he is, you can just use him as a material for the ritual summon. So by doing his job for about 20 years for the ritual decks, he got some attention when Konami was like, hey, why don't we just make this ritual support card an actual ritual? Now we see he's upgraded his jetpack immensely. He's basically tied a full-on jet to his back. His effect is similar to the Master of Right skill in Duel Links, where you can reveal a ritual spell from your hand, and then add a monster listed on that ritual spell to your hand by shuffling the spell back into the deck. He also has a quick effect on your opponent's turn that feels like a Verte Anaconda style effect for rituals, where you can send a ritual ritual spell from the deck to the graveyard, and the bird's effect becomes that spell's effect, so you can immediately ritual summon on your opponent's turn to get some good disruption. As a Nephthys player, I like the idea of using the Nephthys ritual spell with this effect for some untargeted destruction on the opponent's turn. As for Transonic Bird's own ritual spell card, I like how it shows the blueprints of his upgrade. Was he doing this all by himself, or were some scientists like, we can rebuild him? Also, why does the ritual make him dark attribute now. He used to be wind, but what makes him dark with this transformation? If anything, I'd say he's more wind now, and his old self was dark. Look how angry Sonic Bird looks. Aw, 
are you little goggles? Oh, he looks mad. Why is he mad? Did someone try to pet him? Well, I kind of did because I was trying to get a ritual spell from him. Oh, yeah. Don't do that to an eagle. They don't like that. They're not petting birds. They have a job to do. Well, yeah, his job's to help me with this relinquished turbo deck. Number seven, mimicking man-eater bug. The original man-eater bug was one of the first flip effect monsters, alongside the likes of Hane Hane and Skalangle, who stole King Fog's crown in international releases. But Maneater Bug was always a standout of the bunch, mostly because he was in the anime, but also because he was an early destruction effect. You flip him, you destroy a monster. Simple. He was easy to hit over in battle, so it was usually a one-for-one -one exchange, but hey, he had his uses. They tried upgrading him once in the past with Noble Maneater Bug, but he was too weak and inefficient to bring out as a tribute summon monster that you would need to set first, so it seemed that trying to bring this flip monster into the modern day was a failed experiment. However, over 15 years after dropping him altogether, Konami decided to try out Maneater Bug again in the form of a retrain called Mimicking Maneater Bug. His effect starts off the same way as the original. You flip him, you destroy a monster. But once you destroy that monster, you've unlocked the floodgates of his new form. He then gains the attack points of the monster that he destroyed and gets their type. And to go with his type changing effect, he has the extra effect where he can't be destroyed by the effects of monsters with the same type as him. And just to make sure that you can't hit over him like the old man-eater bug, he can't be destroyed in battle, so you actually have a chance to resolve this whole effect. That being said, there are still plenty of other ways to destroy him in the modern game, so this retrain was mostly just for fun. Not sure why they chose to wait until 2021 for this, or why they went with the mimicking angle, but I like this guy. This dude's all skin and bones, I really hope he eats a man soon. I can just feed him a bunch of throwaway cards. But what if he bites the bite shoes? Then they bite back. Well, those aren't men, so why would he eat it? Those I don't are know. shoes. Ask the effects. Target one monster. Oh, he targets face down monsters thinking they might be man, and yet they are bite shoes. From what I've read, the mimicking is because he's supposed to be one of those camouflage leaf bugs backed up by the leaves in the background. So this card gave him more of a specific bug identity beyond just being generic bug with teeth. I also feel like there's a reference with his pose, but I can't put my finger on it. It almost looks like he's trying to do a Sentai style pose. Maybe he's trying out to join the Insectors. Number six, Obnoxious Celtic Guard. We discussed Obnoxious Celtic Guard on our weirdest translated monster name list, but it's also worthy of being on this one since he has the honor of being the monster to coin the word retrain in Yu-Gi-Oh! So he has some of the more unique aspects that come with being the first. This is when Konami realized with weaker normal monsters quickly being power crept from the game, they had to start revamping some iconic ones to keep them relevant in and outside the anime. So why not start with one of Yugi's mainstays, Celtic Guardian, known as Elf Swordsman in Japanese. The retrain premiered in the 2001 Yugi structure deck in Japan. The new twist on this classic monster is he can't be destroyed in battle by any monsters with 1900 or more attack points, so he was pretty good against your opponent's big ol' beat sticks. But then they could just summon their space mambo and attack over it in response, or just use a card like Fissure or something. Now it has a kind of effect. So it's really funny being the founder of everything retrain, but still being essentially nothing other than an additional adjective. See, you're not doing the galaxy brain play, which is where you summon Obnoxious Cut the Guard and equip him with the Horn of the Unicorn, which gives him 2100 attack and 1900 defense. So he just can't be destroyed by battle at all. The weird part with this retrain was his name in Japanese, which was Honro Suru Arufu no Kenshi, which gets translated to Baffling Elf Swordsman, likely in reference to Elf Swordsman's original lore, which states that he baffles enemies with lightning swift attacks. Since the term Honro Suru doesn't directly translate to baffling, he was called obnoxious for the adjective on the English translation, and one of the descriptions of the term Honro Suru I could find is that you're basically in it for yourself and you don't care what happens to those around you, so I could see that as a description of obnoxious. 
Terrorists. There was also the theory that he got this name because his effect was annoying to get around back in the day. Which is obnoxious for monsters with 1900 or more attack. To add to his list of names, when he was first summoned in the anime, Yugi called him the retrained elf swordsman in Japanese, which I guess acted like a quick exposition throwaway line to explain why this swordsman now has an effect. Don't forget about Celtic Guard of Noble Arms. Oh no, I've already forgot. The one in the movie that has the very specific effect that Yugi did once, and that's the only time it'll ever get used. He gained the second sword. He only has two arms. I was expecting more. That one's hard to see. Yeah. I can't search this guy with Arsenal Summoner. What's the point anymore? He's cute! So is Judgment Meter the only one against giving this new Celtic Guard a hard time? I do! Why is nobody with me? I feel alone. I say this many times in the videos I'm in. I don't play bad cards. You Rude. calling him a bad card? He's sad. He's a very bad card. He's sad. He's bad. Retrain He's... him. Make him better. They did. He's still bad. This is the first of two. Him again. They did. They gave him you more attack. That. He's still bad. Again. How many times can you retrain something before it gets stale? The record is six. Number five, Parasite Paranoid. This is a retrain of Parasite Parasite, one of the most unique convoluted cards in Yu-Gi-Oh that seems impossible possible to resolve without loads of setup or cheating. We discussed it in our Weird Flip Monsters video, so to summarize, when flipped, it goes into your opponent's deck, they have to draw it, then it summons itself, inflicts damage, and turns all their monsters on the field to insect type. It was basically impossible to pull off, but we did see it work in the anime with the help of cheating, so at least it had a little time in the sun. So when I heard Parasite Parasite was getting a retrain, I I was like, there's no way they can make this work. And then they actually did a good job. My favorite thing about Parasite Paranoid is they had to change it from being a flip effect because of the way flip effect monsters work. If it's flipped up during the battle phase, its effect activates and then it's immediately destroyed because it was destroyed by battle. The new Paranoid effect emulates how the original Parasite was supposed to function in an easier to use way. It activates from your hand, similar to how your opponent was supposed to draw the original Parasite to activate its negative effects after it goes into their deck, it then equips to a monster on the field, referencing how Parasite Parasite counted as an equipped card for each infected monster in the manga and anime, which is why it didn't work on Gearfreed who destroys equipped cards, turns the equipped monster into an insect, just like what Parasite Parasite did to the opponent's side of the field. The monster equipped with Parasite Paranoid cannot attack or target any of your insect monsters, referencing how you were supposed to put up spells like insect barrier after Parasite Parasite turns all of your opponent's monsters into insects, and if Paranoid is sent to the graveyard after it was equipped, you can summon a level 7 or higher insect monster from your hand ignoring its summoning conditions, likely in reference to how Weevil used high level insect monsters like Insect Queen and Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth against Joey in the anime, and how Insect Queen has her own retrain that can only be special summoned by another card's effect. And because Parasite Paranoid counts as an equip card while turning a monster into an insect, it can be used with Cocoon of Ultra Evolution, which requires a tribute of an insect anywhere on the field equipped with a card, and then you can summon an insect from your deck, ignoring its summoning conditions. I love this card. It basically does all the stuff that Weevil wanted to do in the anime, because he's like, Ha! Joey, now you can't attack! And I summon Insect Queen! It does two things. It makes them not attack, and it summons Insect Queen. It's perfect. I like it. I do. But nothing will ever replace in my heart, Parasite Parasite, for its extremely unique effect of putting itself in the opponent's deck. When you trade a card in the TCG and someone uses it, they are inherently putting the card in your deck. So any card can be a Parasite Parasite. And to add to the references of Parasite Paranoid, its artwork shows it crawling on some guy's arm, who appears to be based on the guy from the Japanese artwork of Parasite Parasite, where that parasite is just burrowing through this guy's face, having a fun time. The uh, Parasite, not the guy. He's definitely not having fun. But this guy's in your left arm. You know what that means, right? You can't play left arm offering. You're done. Your spell cards, you have to draw into them. Number four, Counselor Lily. This retrain always felt like a disappointment to me since its original card, Injection Fairy Lily, was a powerhouse back in the day. It was an early adopter of using life points as a resource. Being able to spend 2,000 life points to boost its attack by 3,000 during damage calculation only on both player 
players' turns, so you either needed a destruction effect or a monster bigger than 3400 attack points to get over her, and 3400 attack was not very common back in the day. And because her original attack was 400, you could easily get her out with cards like Giant Rat or search her with Sangan. They even eventually banned her for a brief period of time, but she was freed shortly after. By the GX era, though, she was power crept out of relevance, but she had a cool legacy behind her. She was also memorable in the anime. She was one of the few monsters who could talk in the Duel Monsters era, as seen in the Pyramid of Light movie, and she was one of the ace monsters of Lecter of the Big Five, which was a funny subversion since Lecter took the form of Big Scary Jinzo in the virtual world, and he was using a cute little fairy girl who was actually a spellcaster. Also, the dub gave Lecter a thick southern accent, so the way he said her name stuck in my head. He was the one who said, Injection Fairy Lily, right? Yes. Can I do my Lecter impression? Yeah, sure, why not? I'm Lecter of the Big Five. I summon Injection Fairy Lily. You see, Mr. Kaiba, I'm a simple country executive of a multi-billion dollar company. Lecter was my favorite of the Big Five because he sounded funny. Now, when I saw Lily was getting retrained as a tuner in the Synchro era back in the day, I was like, oh, sweet. I wonder what kind of crazy power-boosting effect she'll have now. And it was pay 500 life points to have the monster that she was used as Synchro material for gain a thousand attack points. Oh. That's not much. I get that Synchro monsters tended to be big on their own, so a 3000 attack point boost may have been a bit too overpowered, but this effect just felt too weak to be useful. There were better tuner effects out there when this card was released, and it could essentially just be replaced by an Axe of Despair. Plus, her attack increase only lasts until the end of the turn, so it's not even a permanent boost. It's just that after such a bar-setting effect that the original Lily had, her new form felt underpowered. Howard. Though I do like the visual gag of her changing professions from a nurse to a psychiatrist, as her Japanese name translates to mental counselor Lily. That's clever. Is she writing with a scissor? No, that's just a heart pen. I too wish I could write with a heart pen. Then I can give my drawings more love. You can tell that she's definitely matured and put on a pair of glasses. I support people with glasses. And she probably had to get a new PhD with her new form. And now she has a clipboard and a pen, and she's listening to your feelings for $275 an hour. A shame Lily no longer gets to wield a giant flying syringe with her new form. Seems like that was fun. It's okay, because on the weekend she does quilting and Pilates, and that's the story of Counselor Lily. Is that what you were expecting? Hope so. Number three, Mythical Beast Jackal and Mythical Beast Master Cerberus. This one is weird because they took the monster Mythical Beast Cerberus from that spellcaster structure deck, split it into two different monsters about ten years after it was released, and made it into an archetype while they were at it. The original Mystical Beast Cerberus was just a spell counter gimmick monster, where it gained 500 attack points for each spell counter on it, and it would gain spell counters every time you activated a spell card, but then it loses all the spell counters after it battles, so the boost was overall temporary and doesn't really make the card worthwhile. Also, this card called itself a Cerberus when it was more of a Chimera, that's not a three-headed dog. So in the end, this seemed like it was going to be another one-off monster for Yu-Gi-Oh!'s history books. However, in 2018, I guess Konami was sitting on its lore for a while, since they split this Cerberus in two, made them part of a bigger archetype, and put them in the Endymion backstory. I'm assuming they decided to relate those monsters because Cerberus uses spell counters and Endymion has the market on those. And since Cerberus is now with Endymion, the best pendulum monster out there, his two retrains were also pendulum monsters. The skinnier head became Mythical Beast Jackal, who just had the defense of Cerberus, and the wolf-like head became Mythical Beast Master Cerberus, who had double the attack and defense of the original along with double the level. While the these cards work great with each other, on the pendulum side of their stats, they were both scale 4, which means it would not be wise to use them both on the pendulum scale. You can only pendulum summon monsters between the levels of the scales, so if you put these monsters together, you can't pendulum summon anything, since the number between 4 and 4 is nothing. Though that's a bit misleading, these cards synergize well, just not when they're both scales. You can use the jackal to summon the master with the jackal's effect 
or use them as overall support in a pendulum deck. We also saw a batch of other mythical beasts come our way, mostly related back to the Jackal, who appears to be the catalyst for this archetype, at least based on the artwork. And Dimion and his people fuse together animals with the Jackal to create new mythical beasts, like the Garuda. And sometimes the other Cerberus head is involved with the mythical beast combo monster. The point is, they're combining animals here. Don't ask about Gazelle, though. He counts as a phantom beast. And if the Jackal wasn't being fused with anything, we see he's now a king. We even see on one card that King Cerberus is summoning the Jackal, so I'm guessing that this is either how they got merged in the first place, or this is after they got separated and now they're just friends. I'm feeling the latter. Number 2, Gora Turtle of Illusion. This retrain was always weird to me since it was done so early on with a monster that was never seen anywhere, being Gora Turtle, who I really liked. It prevented monsters with 1900 or more attack points from declaring an attack, so I could just pop it in my legendary ocean deck, recruit it off Mother Grizzly, lower my level 4 monsters levels by one with a legendary ocean's effect, and flip up Gravity Bind. Boom! Nothing can move. Just don't touch any of my incredibly fragile floodgates and we got this field on lock. So with no real relevance in the card game or anime, I just expected Gora Turtle to be one and done. But only a couple of sets after it was released, a year later, we got a new form for it. Gora Turtle of Illusions. I was expecting it to be some other cool floodgate like how the original Gora Turtle prevented attacks, but the effect was completely unrelated to the original. It just negated spells and traps that targeted it. So I guess you have something for the Regeki break matchup now. Yeah, this effect doesn't make up for its weak stats or help it against any of the various untargeted destruction that was common at the time. And then we never saw this turtle again in any form after this. Which opens up the question, why did Gora Turtle get a retrain so early on, and why was its effect so different from its original form? I couldn't find anything Gora Turtle was referencing to explain itself or the illusion. No real life animal counterpart, no similarities in any folklore, I don't even know what Gora is supposed to mean. Gora is the name of a few different cities in varying countries, and a Turkish sci-fi comedy movie, none of which seem to reflect Gora Turtle. I also couldn't find any origin for the carvings on its shell. This turtle is so mysterious to me. Furthermore, its retrain just shows it with a slightly different pose and alternate colors compared to the original, so we don't even get any new insight on it from the artwork. It's almost like they just copy and pasted the original onto the retrain. And its stats don't relate to its original form in any way. It went from having 1100 for attack and defense, to 1200 attack and 1400 defense, so it didn't even add up to the total stat line of the original, nor did it follow the pattern of having the same attack and defense value. Though, the difference in stats didn't really matter in the end, since it was barely an upgrade. I just can't figure out why they gave him a retrain so quickly, and why it was so subpar. Were they trying to make Gora Turtle the next Karibo? You know, they would trickle in a new form every so often because he had cute mascot potential. The only difference is Karibo was related to the anime, so everybody loved a new Karibo form. Is it like a Karibon? Yeah. It's like a Karibot. Karibanded even. Sphere Karibo, Karibom, Karib... What's the ghost one? Curry, uh, Wretched Ghost in the Attic. Oh, Curry... God. Curried Goat. Okay, no more Karibo posting during the Gora Turtle segment. Why are there so many? I feel like the proper retrain would just be giving the turtle different floodgate effects, like preventing monsters from certain levels or attack values from activating effects or attacking or just being summoned. Come to think of it, that would just be the Testudo Arat Newman duo. Maybe Gora Turtle's new forms have been with us this whole time and we never noticed. I love Testudo Arat Newman! Picking the number one choice was a bit difficult since every entry was pretty on par with each other when it came to something weird, so we went with the upgraded form that was connected to many other upgraded forms. Also, it's got the name that stands out the most. Number one, Nefarious Archfiend Eater of Nefariousness. We should first start by mentioning the Charmers. The Charmers have always been an archetype that sticks around with each new generation of the game. They're not particularly staples of decks, but hey, they're cute designs that can act as mascots. Though that mostly applies to the older Charmers. The more modern Charmer support is actually pretty splashable in single attribute decks. We initially got one of each elemental attribute, and then we later got a light and dark Charmer. Every so often, a new form would come out for each Charmer, usually with the original four getting their upgrades first. My favorite was always Hita. Look how intense 
intense she looks. However, another major aspect of the Charmers is they all have little buddies, who are minor monsters that relate to their primary attribute, and as the Charmers grow stronger, so do their familiars. The most well known of the familiars is Gigobite, who grew up into one of the versions of Gaga Giga with Area the Water Charmer, but the most interesting to me is Archfiend Marmot of Nefariousness, who was the companion of Asa the Earth Charmer. Look at him, ain't he cute? He's got a big ol' nut and he's just having a good time. But this Marmot soon went through some changes to get a retrain, or more technically, an upgraded form. His new stats and effect now match the other upgraded forms of the familiars, but you know the real reason why he's here. It's that name. It's just a thing in the English translation. I can't wait for the next retrain. Archfiend Nefarious Archfiend Nefarious Eater of Nefarious Archfiend Eaters of Nefarious and Knuckles. The names of the original and the retrain are significantly less ridiculous in Japanese. The Archfiend Marmot of Nefariousness was just called Demon Beaver in Japanese, with that specific demon in the name being the Archfiend archetype in English, which is why he's randomly an Archfiend without having any other relation to the archetype, since he was made before they expanded it into a full archetype. They were just putting demon in its name because it sounded cool. I, I want to address something here. I don't think the people at Konami know what a beaver looks like. Because both times they put beavers. We got Lewis and we've got demon e beaver. Neither of them are beavers. They are both rats, which is very different from a beaver. One more thing. Archfiend Marmot of Nefariousness. Marmot, beaver, either way, he's not supposed to have a horn. So that means he's equipped with Horn of the Unicorn. And his defense on all forms is less than 800. That's shenanigans. Well, that's because Horn of the Unicorn boosts by 700. Ah, oh, damn. The whole bit is ruined. That's me. I'm the bit ruiner. Then when the wave of evolutions for the elemental familiars came out, their forms were made less cute and they all got effects related to special summoning themselves when spellcasters were on the field because the charmers were spellcasters. While the other upgrades got pretty standard names, the localization team was just like, let's go crazy, and gave us Nefarious Archfiend Eater of Nefariousness for the Marmot's new name. Oh no! Oh no, what's wrong with him? Oh hey, Hellman. I love this guy. Once again, the Japanese name is more simple, referencing its original Japanese name by now calling him Demon Eater. But when you think about it, the Japanese and the English name still imply the same thing. The English name just takes a lot more syllables to say it. He's the eater of something evil. He himself isn't evil, he's just Earth attribute, but he does look a tad angry, but that's only when you try to pet him when he's eating his meal. Who's, whose head is that? Who's, whose head is that? Who let this man eat a head? Me. See, there you go. He's eating a nefarious demon right in front of us, being the head of Archfiend Soldier. Guess he is related to the Archfiends in another way. Then all the familiars got Awakening of the Elemental Forms, with a hyphen and everything in their title, where they're leaping away from their respective charmer and doing some cool stuff in the air. While they all got pretty standard names again, they kept up with giving the Marmot a silly name, calling him Nefarious or Archfiend. They couldn't do as long of a name for this one since they had to fit that whole title in there, but they found a way to keep this reoccurring joke alive. So for being involved with the running gag of the most ridiculous naming pattern in Yu-Gi-Oh, Nefarious Archfiend Eater of Nefariousness wins round two of the weirdest Yu-Gi-Oh monster retrains. Now, what did you think? Did any of these retrains make you wonder, or were some of them too standard to even bat an eye at? What are some of your favorite Yu-Gi-Oh retrains in general? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and we will see you in the next video.